again tonight we're looking at the book of Jude which subject of course is contending for the faith once delivered to the saints we are contend for the faith and with those who crept in unawares and of course that is the same truth we see in Romans chapter 16 17 through 20 as we look at this again tonight we're going to be looking at gospel centrism contending against gospel centrism which is something relatively new within the last 30 years or so but it's become very dominant within uh, reformed circles of fundamentalism uh, especially what we know as historical fundamentalism which is of course that which rose out of the modernist controversy in response to um, the denial of the word of God but we want to differentiate between historical fundamentalism and biblical fundamentalism. They're not the same things. And we'll see that tonight. So in the context of what we're looking at tonight, we're seeing that we are to contend against. Those who crept in unawares, of course, are people who take this text and they'll say, well, this we're not ever supposed to contend with other Christians. <laughs> and I want to say, oh my goodness, how naive can you get? Uh, the very fact is that the vast majority of contending were people with people who could profess to be Christians, but who were corrupting doctrine. And they'd come in and crept into the church, and now we're covertly trying to undermine the Bible and the teachings, of course, of inspired words of God in the epistles in order to build their own sects of Christianity. And this has been going on for Millennia happened in Judaism, and uh, we'll look at that as well tonight. So we're going to read verses 17 through 20 again, just so we get the context. Paul here in his summary chapter of the book of Romans, uh, he says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. This is going on inside the church. This isn't outside the church. These are other people who had come, come into the church are now causing divisions within the church, doctrinal divisions. And it says, For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. Otherwise, they're trying to uh, make sure they've got food on the table. And uh, rather than they're not standing for truth, they're willing to sacrifice truth for food. And uh, by good words and fair speech it deceived the hearts of the simple. For your obedience has come abroad unto all men. Now he praises those that faithful at Rome. I'm glad therefore on your behalf, but I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning uh, evil. And of the uh, God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen, or so be it. Let's have a word of prayer together. Our Father, as once again we bow before you tonight, we pray that you will teach us by your spirit the things we need to know. Help us, Lord, to understand the grave responsibility of what it means to contend for your faith, the faith you've given us, the words of God, the doctrines that you've given us. And help us to understand that when we contend against those that oppose themselves, they also become our ministry. We are trying to reach them with the truth. And so, Father, we pray. We pray for both our, the truth tonight, that it will be received with thanksgiving. And for those that oppose the truth, that they would see their failures and repent. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, we're talking about divisions here. Uh, Romans chapter, mark them which cause divisions. So once a division is created, 
and an individual is then disjoined from the unity of the one faith, that one faith we're to contend for. This creates a faction or a new sect within Christianity. And remember, there's only one faith. So any sect that is not aligned with that one faith by rightly dividing the word of God, they've wrongly divided the word of God. They've created another kind of Christianity, which is not Christianity at all. It ceases to be. If it's not biblical Christianity, it's not Christianity. So therefore, this division in doctrine leads to what is called heresy. Division leads to heresy. It is a heresy that causes the division. So the word heresy in the New, T New Testament uh, is from a word, heresis, and it basically means to choose a party or a sect. So the negative aspect of the word heresy refers to the removing of an individual from the mainstream of Bible-believing Christianity to another division that wants to represent itself now as a mainstream of, uh, or the norm. And so now, this is denominationalism. This is what developing out of this particular period of time. <clears throat> so the Greek word here is often translated by the word sect rather than by the word heresy. For instance, in Acts 15, uh, 517, we have the sect or the heresy of the Sadducees. There was a sect or the heresy of the Pharisees, Acts 15, 5. Uh, on, one, on two occasions, true Christianity was called heresy by the Jews because they thought Christianity was just another sect of Judaism when it wasn't. Paul refers to visions within the church at Corinth as heresy in 1 Corinthians 11, 17 through 9. So Paul referred to heresies as one of the manifestations of the works of the flesh in Galatians chapter 5, 19 through 21. That's a division. And Paul, Peter referred to the division, uh, divisive teaching of the false teachers as what? Damnable heresies. And of course, uh, in 2 Peter 2, 1, they ultimately deny the lordship of Jesus Christ. Otherwise, you bring in a heresy uh, that is contrary to the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ, that one faith, then you deny the lordship of Jesus Christ. So the point is that even though individuals who pretend uh, unity, but hold to some divisive theological position, thereby creating a new faction or a sect within Christianity, these divisions are the very essence of what defines the word heresy. So although Paul uses the word divisions in Romans 16, 17, uh, it's not the Greek word heresies. The outcome of these divisions is heresy. So if these divisions were not stopped, more heresy or new sects would be created. And there were all kinds of these, of course. Galatians, he talks about the legalists or the Judaizers. In Colossians, he talks about those who uh, taught legalism, mysticism, asceticism, and Gnosticism. These were all sects or corruption that come into Christianity and created new sects of Christianity, that claimed to be new sects of Christianity, but they were all opposed by the inspiration of the Word of God. So the faith, when we talk about the word faith, what we are to, for what we are to contend is fundamentally biblical. We talk about fundamentalism, it is the faith. That is biblical fundamentalism. It's the faith. Every jot and tittle of it. So the Bible is a revelation of God and God's will to be known only through faith by believing the Bible to be the inspired words of God. Any form of Christianity is not that's not a, that's not biblical ceases to be Christianity. I just here you are. Think of this. Here you are now in the curse. You can't see God. There's no way you can empirically have any knowledge of God whatsoever. Eye hath not seen, ear hath not heard, neither entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him. So we are completely in the dark and ignorant about who God is, uh, except for our general knowledge that there's a creation, there must be a creator. Now God begins to reveal to us who he is through 
direct communication, so he brings light into the darkness. The Word of God is that same thing. God brings light into the darkness. So how do we know God? Well, we look at the light. That's the Word of God. We walk in the light. That's how we have fellowship with God. So we have to rightly divide the word of truth is what defines biblical fundamentalism. If it's wrongly divided in any way, it ceases to be biblical fundamentalism. So if some, some add, someone adds to what the Bible teaches, their Christianity seeks to be fundamentally biblical. If one subtracts or reduces what the Bible teaches, their Christianity ceases to be fundamentally biblical. It's no longer fundamental. So in, an, in either case, biblical Christianity or fundamentalism ceases and becomes something else. So anytime I use the word or refer to myself as a fundamentalist, it is referring to myself as what the Bible teaches, the faith, that I believe in, and search and seek for. I'm not talking about historical fundamentalism or new fundamentalism or any of these things. Those evolved and are not biblical fundamentalism. So adding to what the Bible teaches is hyper-fundamentalism. That means more than. Can't be more than biblical. You can't have more than the faith. Uh, that's why I'm very careful when I'm speculating about something to let you know I'm speculating about it or giving my opinion. Uh, subtracting or reducing importance or minimizing the doctrines that the Bible teaches is hypo-fundamentalism or less than. Both can be equally troubling, troublesome, and divisive. And they can create sex. How many hypo-fundamentalists do you know? Well, certainly Baptist churches are not immune to hypo-fundamentalism. I've had, you know, I've talked to some of these guys and uh, you have a whole group of them in the Ruckmanite double inspiration camp. Uh, those are all hypo-fundamentalists. They're not, um, and then you have those who say, well, this doctrine is not important. We're not going to separate over this or soft separatism. That's all hypo-fundamentalism. That's less than what the Bible teaches. And we have to be careful. And that's what God warned about in very early in the, in the books of the law, in Deuteronomy chapter 4, and two, first two verses. He says, Now, therefore hearken, O Israel, unto the statutes. That's all of God's directives regarding sanctity and worship details. And unto the judgment. That's all of God's directives regarding civil affairs. What happens if we, there's a difference between uh, judic adjudicating problems that are civil and those that are criminal. So there was a whole, God, God had given great directives in the book of Leviticus regarding how we deal with someone's civil affairs. What happens if uh, in, uh, somehow if I injure one of your oxen and uh, one of my responsibilities civilly to take care of that. So he says, under the statutes and under the judgments which I teach you for to do them, that ye may live and go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers giveth you. Ye shall not add unto the word. Add to it. That's hyper, hypo, hyper, there we go. And which I command you, neither shall you diminish aught from it. That's hypo fun, fundamentalism. That you may keep the judgments of the Lord your God which I command you. If you add to it, you're not keeping it. You say, well, I'm just, I'm just building fences here just to make sure. I believe that's what Adam did when at least what might have been communicated to Eve. Maybe. Eve said, you're not even supposed to touch it. Don't eat of it. Don't, we're not even supposed to touch it. Well, I, that's not what God said. And so Adam most probably told Eve something that more than what God had said. And uh, trying to protect her, of course, but he still shouldn't do that. And it's not, it's not correct to do that. If you can't support what you believe with scripture, it is either hyper or hypo. Hyper is just as dangerous as hypo. Above or beyond, either one, uh, or less than. 
So I'm going to give you nine characteristics of hypo-fundamentalism. Fundam I can look at a lot of things tonight that are hyper-fundamentalism. And, uh, you know, as soon as you start talking to people, well, that's uh, that you've added to the Word of God. There's no way you can support that. And they will give you some obscure verse of Scripture and support it. Uh, and, of course, it doesn't mean that at all when you tell them exactly, exegate, exegete the text, rightly divide it. Well, so that's not what that text says. I'm glad you believe that. If you want to believe it, you're welcome to it. But that's hyper-fundamentalism. Uh, so we're going to look at hypo. The, hy the prefix hypo is derived from the Greek word under, defective, or inadequate. It's below the standard. So number one, hypo-fundamentalism abdicates biblical dogma dogmatism and promotes an ever-growing inclusivism in theological issues. We find this going on over and over again. Years ago, I wrote an article about uh, the abdication of biblical dogmatism. I saw that going on within Baptist churches and within uh, what was termed there Baptist fundamentalism. The, everything was being questioned. And even though you might be able to uh, deal with something biblically, they would say, well, here. It's like a man who said, uh, what was your position on divorce? And he said, well, I can give you five, I can give you and, def and defend five different positions on divorce. You know, and, I, and my question, well, what's your position? And his answer was, I really don't really have one. Well, how are you going to administrate the church? I mean, you have to make a choice, right? So although hypo-fundamentalism may not accept false doctrines as true, they are tolerant and accepting of those holding various degrees of false doctrine. Therefore, they seek to redefine biblical fundamentalism and biblical separatism into various degrees of soft separatism. So this was the sin of Peter and Bar Barnabas, I believe, in Galatia. In Acts uh, 15, 1 through 6, and Galatians 2, 11 through 12, wasn't that they were preaching in a, a Judaism, otherwise adding of circumcision and holy days and all that stuff to the gospel, but they were tolerating it. And they weren't separating those people out from the churches at Galatia. The second is hypofundamentalism has a corrupted view of ecclesiology. Ecclesiology is a doctrine of the church. Today, the church exists in local churches only. There is a mystical church being built, but it has never assembled yet and will not assemble until that day the Lord says, come on home. And when we then, that will be the first assembly of that church. Right now, the functional entity of the church is always local churches. That's why the seven epistles of Christ in Revelations are written to what? Local churches. A couple of them were local churches, but they were still local churches. So failing to make distinctions regarding dispensational transitions, they adopt the kingdom age view of the church and adapt that view into the church age. Otherwise, the theonomic rule. And of course, that theonomy is kingdom constructionism and all those things. So... This corrupts such texts as Ephesians 4, 1 through 6 from a local view of the, of the church ecclesiology to a universal or a mystical view of ecclesiology within all the ambiguity of what defines modern day Christianity. So then now if we take Ephesians chapter 4, 1 through 16 and we apply the commandment to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace, that must be done within all of Christendom rather than within a local assembly. Uh, and, and you see why some of these guys have to tap dance all around these doctrines of separation. So hypofundamentalism increasingly accepts varying degrees of Reformed theology, often beginning with Calvin's uh, doctrine of salvation and the willingness to accept or tolerate Reformed views of eschatology, that's the end times, and ecclesiology or the doctrine of the church. Uh, I've always said people who want to be Calvinists, they praise Calvin. I said, he couldn't get his salvation right, couldn't get his ecclesiology right, couldn't get his eschatology right, he couldn't get his ecclesiology right, but he was a great theologian. 
And that's called sarcasm if you didn't know, didn't recognize it. So uh, that's the craziness of it all. Number three, hypofundamentalism rejects the preservation of God's inspired words and accepts and adopts eclectic textual criticism or reconstructionism as your model of eclectic reconstructionism of the Bible. Almost all of those who are hypo-fundamentalists below reject the King James Bible as a preserved word of God in the English language. And they reject the preservation of God's word in any Greek text or any group of Greek texts. And yet they dare still call themselves fundamentalists. Although they claim to believe in the verbal plenary inspiration of the scriptures in the autographs, the originals, they do not believe they have the preservation of these inspired words in any apograph or copy or group of apographs. Uh, although they usually reject dynamic inspiration of the originals in their view of preservation, they have practically can only accept dynamic preservation because they can never be confident their reconstructed track text have the exact preserved words from the original. So that is very much part of hypo-fundamentalism. The fourth one, hypo-fundamentalism rejects militant opposition against doctrinal heretics and promotes an ongoing dialogue with them as opposed to separation from them. They're marking them and avoiding them, as, as the text says. This is what I call apposition, coming alongside, rather than opposition, dividing, your, dividing them some from the, from the body. And they become now ministry, not partners in ministry. In apposition, there are varying degrees of allowed fellowship, ambiguously defined, so as to allow for ongoing discussion rather than obeying the biblical demand. A man that is a heretic after the first and second admonition, reject. Uh, don't keep beating that dead horse. It's not going anywhere. Number five, hypofundamentalism accepts ever-increasing degrees of soteriological inclusivism, otherwise all kinds of different positions on salvation, and soteriological reductionism, otherwise even though they reduce things down to a very minimal, like uh, the uh, hyper, the, the uh, sovereign grace movement, uh, and now the free grace movement, it says all you have to do is believe in Jesus, you need to understand the gospel. You don't have to believe in the deity of Christ. You don't have to understand or believe anything Jesus accomplished. Just believe in Jesus and you're saved. Those are the extremes. And they're becoming more accepting of all of these. And that, of course, is the universal Jesus of the emergent church. So although there's an ongoing discussion regarding these easy believism, predeterminism, predestination, lordship, salvation, monergism, only believes it is even the cross's gospel. Although there's an ongoing discussion, these variations, they continue in varying degrees of cooperative ministry within the dialogue. Now they're not willing to come out and mark them and avoid them. Number six, hypofundamentalism seeks cultural relevancy above personal sanctity. Otherwise, they'll sacrifice sanctification for cultural relevancy. It's more important that the culture accepts us than Jesus accepts us. And that is what's going on. The argument is how can we reach them if we can't talk to them? Well, uh, you may not be able to, but that's a sign of the times. So this exists on numerous levels. However, on whatever level it exists, it is sacrificing God's supernatural and enabling grace for the world's friendship or acceptance. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You, these people claim to love the world more than God does. This is another level of apposition and the belief that ministry to a culture is done as part of that culture rather than separation from that culture by establishing a local church counterculture within the culture. Hypofundamentalists seek to obfuscate the line of demarcation that separates the believer from being in the world, John 17, 11, rather than of the world, John 15, 18 through 19, and 17 uh, through 14. They want to get to the place where we actually almost remove that line of demarcation. 
It's no longer there. Otherwise, now you you can you know be be what Billy Graham did. You know, just the same thing. Chapter or number seven. Hypofundamentalism seeks to avoid being viewed as religious fanatics at almost any sacrifice to true bibl uh, biblicism. They do not want to be seen as fanatics. They don't want to be radicalized or marginalized by the culture. Now, this is another part of cultural relevancy. This is manifested in the extreme by introducing contemporary Christian rock music into the worship services, the tolerations of practices such as contemplative prayer, which comes out of mysticism, tongue speaking, social drinking, premarital sex, general worldliness and dress and entertainment. Many hypo-fundamental churches no longer require abstinence from the use of alcohol and refuse to make a social drinking a test of fellowship. Sin is spoken of in generalities rather than specifics. A common word expressing distaste for these tests of fellowship is a word legalism, as defined by them contrary to biblical norms. So they've completely redefined legalism to fit within their hypo-fundamentalism. Now, number eight, hypo-fundamentalism adopts the right and left terminology of centrism while always viewing themselves as being the center. And, of course, this has been a problem. I've been speaking about this for over 25 years, and it's just starting to be addressed by some of the younger pastors now, and they're seeing it and addressing it, which I'm, I'm very grateful for. But their word for this is balanced. Well, I'm a, I'm, I try to be balanced. Now, what we all do, but they use that term to condone what they're doing as it's moving towards the center, because the center is always moving. Once you start moving towards the center, you've got to keep moving, because the, move, the center is always moving. So their word for this is balance, which they mean only their defined allowances from deviation from the center. So they've established their center, and this is a new norm. All to the right of them are dogmatic hypers, and therefore rejected as unmovable. Everyone to the left, left of them are potential friends. Because if you're moving to the left, you understand that those are, that's the direction you're moving. So true biblicists see no right or left. When referring to biblical truth, true biblicists see only right and wrong. Now number nine, hypofundamentalist. Fundamentalism favors varying degrees of multiplicity of elder rule that leads more towards Presbyterian polity in board-administrated churches rather than congregational polity administrated under the leadership of a godly pastor, elder, bishop. Pastor, elder, bishop is all the same office, just different terms describing different functions of that office. Pastor is the shepherd. Elder, elders, of course, is the, um, the uh, position of... of uh, uh, administration, bishop as well. But in many cases, this is a theological reaction against the apparent abuses of ungodly pastors, elders, bish bishops who lord over God's people. And uh, it's easy to be labeled that when you are saying, no, you can't do that. Um, you know, I would have said to my dad that he was a harsh disciplinarian. And when he said no, he meant no. And that should be true, of course, within the, those who rule over you, according to doctrine. Now, they, they can't rule over you just any way they want. It has to be according to the doctrines. That's why Paul said, be followers together in me as I am a follower of Christ. Literally, only, even only in as I am a follower of Christ. You don't have to follow me in any other way. So, rather, true congregational polity should Biblically correct those of these abuses through confrontation and reproof. Hypofundamentalism think they have a better way than God's way. And they have adopted other methodologies. So I hope you got those down tonight. And if you haven't, watch this again and get them because you're seeing this all being fulfilled before your eyes. Um, you know, I wrote this article on hypofundamentalism, I think about seven years ago uh, or, or so, 
And uh, it was in, a, in response to someone who accused me of being a hyper-fundamentalist for all the reasons that are exactly the opposite of what hypofundamentalism is. So God, gospel centrism has been around for many years. In most part, it's been in the new evangelical neo-orthodox camps of theology. And within these camps of gospel centrism has always been part of varying degrees of false views regarding the doctrine of the church, ecclesiology. So now they have to redefine the doctrine of separation or remove it from anything that professes to be Christian. I had a lady tell me one time, Christians shouldn't separate from other Christians. And uh, of course, nothing, nowhere in the Bible that that is true. In fact, most of the separation that I've ever practiced in my life has not had to been practiced at all. Because people oftentimes, when they want to go another direction to start another sect, they separate from us. That's what, they, that's what happens when someone gets up out of a church and walks out the back door and starts going someplace else where they go start another church of their own. So both New Evangelical and Neo-Orthodox proponents view the church as some large mystical entity of the elect, the regenerated and yet to be regenerated, uh, chosen by God. And this view of the church has been rapidly spreading through independent fundamental Baptist churches who become converted to Reformed theology in varying degrees. These are Baptists who want to call themselves New Reformed. They are becoming more and more soft in their separation issues and more and more accepting of denominations who are reformed in their views. They are abandoning uh, elder-run churches for boards of elders, uh, which essentially is not, instead of having deacons, uh, they've done that. The Northern Baptist Convention had deacon boards, which is another form of Presbyterian polity. No such thing in the Bible as deacon boards. I was a, came out of their Northern Baptist Convention a government structure and all the stuff that goes down it because they control the churches or they tried to until most of the churches left the Northern Baptist Convention. And when, in doing so, they fought with them and you know the churches here in Minnesota uh, stuck with it until they got their buildings and things back. Otherwise, they'd have lost all the buildings in the Northern Baptist Convention. Uh, Dr. Clearwater used to say, I'm sticking along to Staring along, so I, I get the, I get the buildings and the furniture and the, and the hymnals. He said, "I'm, I'm going to stay fighting until we get it all." So, because of this errant view of the church, Doctor Clearwaters and uh, was a local church man, uh, and of course, Doctor uh, Page wrote an excellent book on the local church as well. These were all local church men uh, here in Minnesota. And their view of biblical unity is proportionately distorted as well when they hold to an errant view of the church. So depending upon what the church, uh, to, upon what camp to which someone aligns theologically, there is a proportionate reduction of necessary agreement, otherwise theological unity and other doctrines before fellowship can be established. Today we can somehow have unity with complete discord. I don't know how that works, but somehow they figured it all out. Now, a few more minutes here. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, here Paul is again contending for the faith against individuals within the church at Corinth, professed to be believers, and he's harshly correcting the Corinthian believers for their carnal divisions in the church. He says, I'd like to write unto you as under, under spiritual, but I can't because you're carnal, because there are divisions in the church. His rebuke was not because they had refused to separate from those teaching false doctrine. He rebuked them because they had created divisions between themselves regarding whom it was that baptized them and of whom they considered the higher authority for what was being taught, minimizing what the apostle Paul taught because they rejected his apostleship. So therefore they were saying he doesn't have any authority to tell us what to do. So divisions in the church were developing that would lead to sectarianism just exactly like it happened in Judaism, like the rabbinical schools existing there within Judaism. And uh, you were known in Judaism by what rabbinical school you attended. 
And uh, some of them were liberal, some of them were, you know, more strict. But sectarianism was not to be part of Christianity. Unfortunately, this is not what's come to pass. We have men who are more loyal to their alma mater or some teacher or professor than they are to Christ. And such is the problem caused by the movement that has come to be known as gospel centrism. <coughs> Bible colleges and cemetery, cemetery, seminaries, cemeteries, <coughs> somebody said I went to cemetery, it didn't, seminary, it didn't hurt me much, but uh, I, I think my semin seminary helped, but uh, it was a good one. But Bible colleges and seminaries are the new rabbinical schools. And Bible professors are the new rabbis. You give me an hour with any guy and we talk enough, I tell you just about where he went to school or who he's reading. Uh, I can tell you that very quickly. But gospel centrism finds its origins in Karl Barth's dialectic theology. Dialect is that having a dialogue. And of course that came to be known as neo-orthodoxy. Neo-orthodoxy neo was nothing new and it was not orthodox. Neo-orthodoxy primary is, took Barth's position on inspiration. It believed the Bible contained the word of God. So uh, we don't pray for the truths that are contained in the word of God. The whole Bible is the truth. It does not, it does, they, they say the Bible contains the, the truth, but not all of its truth. Um, and, of course, that's not right. Uh, Carl, uh, Charles Ryrie addressed Barth on orthodox gospel centrism and addressing Barth's radical view of this new orthodox and existential view of biblical separation. Existentialism is, I think, you'll, therefore I am. Um, that's a view of God. I, I am. I can't prove God is, but I can prove I am. So uh, Ryrie, here's what he said. Karl Barth, 1886 to 1968, though one of the most influential theologians in recent history, held a defective and dangerous view of inspiration, a view many continue to propagate. Barthians generally align themselves with the liberal school of biblical criticism, eclectic textual criticism, yet they often preach like evangelicals. This makes Barthianism more dangerous than blatant liberalism. Why? Because this is exactly what Jude is talking about. Those who crept in unawares. They preach like evangelicals so they can get the evangelical audience. And they listen to them. And what happens? They're converted to this Barthian view, this dialectic theology, and uh, now they get involved in the dialogue instead of just thus saith the Lord. Now granted, most of the so-called fundamental gospel centrists would not go so far as Barth in his weak view of inspiration. However, like Barth, they do tend to categorize doctrines. <coughs> major on the majors, minor on the minors. If you hear that phrase, you're listening to someone who holds the Barthian position of dialectic theology, especially on his position of uh, uh, inspiration. And of course, they tend to categorize doctrine according to some highly subjective, not objective by facts, highly subjective criteria of importance. That's all the rules of eclectic textual criticism, which would take another couple hours tonight if I were to just list the rules. Uh, can we find any such pattern in their discussions for subjective categorizing of doctrines according to importance, so they might have some form of ambiguous unity. Oh, well, yes, many fundamentalists categorize doctrine by categories of importance to them. And uh, like I said, I've called myself a jot and tittle fundamentalist. fundamentalist. Uh, otherwise, I, 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 don't, I, I don't believe there's any doctrine that's unimportant to God. Otherwise, that we should mar marginalize. There are some doctrines which we can be more dogmatic about, because we have more scriptural evidence, more scriptural testimony to them. But there are no, there are no doctrine that's unimportant to God. All of it is. So we have to think about it. We'll stop there tonight. <clears throat> Any uh, questions or comments you might have? Okay, I must have gone too fast again tonight. Huh? So.
Let's have a word of prayer and then we'll take prayer requests. Thank you, Father, tonight for uh, your scripture, especially uh, Romans chapter 16. And Lord, uh, what we've seen there for the book of Jude, for First and Second Peter, for Galatians, for First and Second Corinthians, for the three epistles of John, Lord, the book of Colossians, the book of Hebrews. What a wonderful book, Father. And even the book of Revelations in the seven letters of Christ to the churches, which gives us such instructive, corrective teaching. We praise you tonight that you are the God that contends and help us to partner with you in what you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, prayer requests tonight. <clears throat> 